But going through this time, it definitely, at least for me, showed me some things of value. And in terms of the church, just real quickly, I already opened it with, it's the value of corporate worship in person. I love worship. I listen to it a lot, et cetera, et cetera. But after a few weeks of just seeing it on YouTube or your computer, I was like, man, I like being there. There's just something about being there. Um, and some of my best memories are being in those environments. I've dug out some old Morningstar DVDs of stuff from 15 years ago, of conferences we went to. They were great, but I was like, it was even better there when I was there. I love IHOP music, but I remember when I was at the IHOP One Thing conference with 13,000 people. I loved the, the videos, but it's even better being there. And so, you know, I want both and just keep doing both. The other was the value of just being around people. I uh, We did not do live streaming uh, from RC, and, and there were some reasons for that. But um, I did minister six times on some online service with four different ministries and um it's better than nothing but it's really not that much fun to 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 do it that way uh the worst experience april the 19th that weekend i spoke i was scheduled for six months to go to augusta georgia to minister at tom lunger's church so he said all right we're gonna do it online he ministers on saturday night so we did it and so we got set up on Zoom, and it's a smaller church, and so smaller than we. So they, whoever wanted to, call in on Zoom. So they did the worship, and and then um, it was my turn to speak, and they all turned their videos off. I don't know if they went, took a shower, if they were there, they get food, they all muted. So I'm talking to a computer of all these little squares with no picture on it. And some of them didn't, hadn't even opened an account, so it didn't even have their initials on it. And so, I, you know, for 30 minutes, I'm talking to these squares. <laughs> that is not easy. <laughs> I just want to tell you. You know, when you're on the other end, you're seeing my video, but you're just not realizing. He's, and, and like halfway through it, I was like, is there anybody still listening? <laughs> and one guy turned his video on, gave me a thumbs up, and then turned it right back off. <laughs> And I'm like, okay, this is better not being there, but I really don't want to do this again. <laughs> and it just showed me, you know, there, there's value in it. I watch a lot of those. But being on the other side, I was like, dude, this is, even for an introvert like me, this is getting old, <laughs> okay? And um, so I just learned the value of, of community. The biggest thing is something we actually started a year ago. With here about a year ago, we did a a talk, or I did a talk on rest. You know, y'all know we talked about it. And so, was the value instead of using the word rest, I say I'll, I'll use the word stillness. Okay, that seemed to be more of an appropriate word for me. The last six weeks, the value of stillness, and it's so interesting though. In in the nineties, a prophet by the name of Bob Jones, you've heard me talk about him before. He helped launch Morningstar. He helped with his words launch uh, IHOP. Uh, he was one of the Kansas City prophets in the 70s, if you've, if you've heard, if you've been around that, that stream. So in the 90s, over 20 years ago, he, he said the 20s, this is the point I want to make here as we talk for the next few minutes. He said the 20, 2020s, so we've got the, this is, we were five months Four months into the, to 120 months, okay? We got 10 more years. He said the 20s is going to be characterized and it's going to be known as the decade of rest. Now that's powerful. Okay? Now I don't think God brought the COVID-19. That doesn't mean we can't learn stuff from it. But how ironic, it can't be a coincidence that the entire world is shut down for the first four months. Well, you know, we had a break in January. The first four months of this next decade. And so for those that are listening, listen. This, I want to learn the lessons of stillness and rest 
And I got a feeling, even though I talked about it a year ago, it's going to be a common theme this decade. I want to learn this stuff. And as the economy starts awaking a little bit more, some of you aren't even really affected by it except not going to church. But I want to learn these lessons because it's important to what God is saying. <clears throat> Every national prophet that I've followed and the local ones I've known have all said something that the Lord is using this for a reset. So many people have said that. I've watched carefully. I'm sure somebody has said it, but I haven't been able to figure it out or find it. What is he resetting? It got, I believe that, but the ones I found, it's like, okay, what's the reset? I personally never heard what the reset was. And so what that tells at least me is that we've got to get before the Lord It's going to start with the individual and then work its way out. There's lots of prophecies. The thing that got the closest to it is the third great awakening is going to come out of this. But they were saying that before COVID-19. And so I believe a third great awakening, which is more than just a revival. It's an awakening. You could call it a reformation where society's even changed. I believe that's going to come, but I'm more and more convinced, and I throw it out to you to think about, this time of rest we've had the last six weeks, the biggest fruit I've seen, even in the talks that's come before me, the three talks, and in my talks and the other things I've heard, is that the awakening is starting with us first for us to awaken to Holy Spirit, Jesus the Father, whichever one's speaking to you, what He's saying to position us in the right place. And out of that comes the reset. The biggest challenge, I think, going forward is, obviously there's some things that we have to return to, like if you didn't work, you got to work, some different things. But it's very important, I ask for those that 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 read the Live Close uh, devotional text that we sent out, I sent out a thing, and I think it's paramount as, as things start to come back to normal, depending on where you're at, is we really need, I challenge you to write it down on a piece of paper or, or Apple Notes or Android Notes, whatever your device of record is, what is it that he has asked me to stop? It's very easy just to start doing what we did before, have a good six week, it, weeks, it's a memory of thing, it's a testimony, but God doesn't work that way. He wants us to go from glory to glory. So as we've learned some things, let's don't let the busyness, the noise, so to speak, as Alexis said, come back in. It's going to take a discipline. There is a discipline of solitude. There is a discipline of silence to to, and a discipline of stillness that we, he wants us to keep going forward. I don't know if I wrote the verse down. Oh, right, here's a good verse. Wasn't the one I was thinking of. But in Matthew 14, 22, immediately Jesus made the disciples get into the boat. He just had a huge meeting with 5,000 men plus women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowd. Verse 23. After he had dismissed them, he went up on a mountainside by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. We, whether we're introverts, it's easier for us, or whether we're extroverts, and it's more of a challenge. We need to take regular times of alone so that we can then be more productive when we're around people. Extroverts will always be around. Introverts tend to always want to be alone. You you pick your side. But we need both, but they are the strength and the effectiveness and the productivity of around will come from being alone. If Jesus can dismiss thousands of people and just say, all right, we've had a great meeting, but we're not going to have a second one. 
And that's what happened there. He was so close to the Father, he knew what to do. And so I think three questions. One is, what has we been doing? That maybe we're for a season. Hopefully, I don't think any of them were sin. Or you had already known to drop them. But some things we were doing that we need to stop doing. What are things that we need to reemphasize being around, doing, that comes from a strength of being alone? And what are some things maybe we need to pick up that we weren't doing before? Don't pass this season without doing that self-introspection. Hopefully we've been doing it all along. Um, Some people have been doing it continually, and these six weeks were no different than the other times. But I think the word somebody said continually early is a big deal. Continually take time to be still. And it's not just for what we do. One of the things stillness just really brought home to me and does is it brings identity and purpose of who you are without doing. One of the questions that came up several times, Lord, show me who I am when I'm not doing anything. I'm telling you, You will be a so much more powerful minister or worker when your energy is not, that's not part of your identity. We do have assignments. But who am I apart from what I do? Some people die and never answer that question. And that is the value of stillness. Um... One of the, there's two, and I could talk a long time, but one of the things, and I had to learn this. When we first started this, every one of my buddies, everybody on the planet, seems like every church, started doing live streaming services. And I went to the Lord, and the Lord said, why do you want to do that? And I said, I feel like that's what I'm supposed to do. And in a sarcastic tone, he goes, wow, that's a great reason to do it. I mean, we do learn from others. I push in. He goes, I don't think you need to do that. On the back side, the Lord was teaching me personally and then our church to model rest and not just keep doing what we were always doing in a different form. And he told me, he said, your people's mature. You don't really have any babies. They know how to go get fed wherever or do whatever they do. But something that was cool that came out of that is he did show our worship team to go and help other churches in their worship that they normally could have never done because of activities here. And so on Sunday for six weeks, anywhere from one to four people from our worship team went to Northwest. And it was an awesome blending supporting another ministry, but blending with them and created something in the kingdom that if I had live-streamed, it would have kept from happening. And so the Lord had other things in mind. The last service was last Sunday. Saturday night, the Lord said, I want you to go go up there. So I texted Michael, because they were trying to keep it to ten people. I said, "Um, uh, do you have room for one more? So he did, and I went. And it was neat. The last service, it was all over. They stopped the live stream. And the Lord just showed me a picture of, of what was going on. Make it short, he, he had me face him north. And I got the word ahead of time, so I had to pull up my, my iPhone and figure out where north was. And he showed me a map in my head. And if you look, Relationship Church, is, the, the physical building is almost directly south of their church. And the Lord just, anyway, I'm trying to make a long word short, we had our whole team come behind Michael, had him face north, and the Lord just, because they had sewed into him for six weeks, and the Lord just said, there's been betrayal here, there's been hurt here, there's been trauma here, as there always is in anybody's life, in pastor's life. And the Lord just said, we have your back. 
and we stand with you. We won't say anything bad about you. We're in covenant relationship with you, but we had proved it for six weeks. I say we loosely, mostly the worship team and Sean. (laughs) And so it was a powerful object lesson that came towards the end that did something in the kingdom. And if I had been so busy because I thought I was supposed to, that was one of the things I was to model and model as a church to lay down and not do the expected. And sometimes that's hard because everybody asked me, you're going to do live stream? I said, no, we're not supposed to. They all looked at me like, they never said anything because they respect me and who they are, but you're missing a valuable opportunity. I would, sh- what we did there in other places, like I said, I ministered in four different ministries six different times over those six weeks. That would have never happened if we were stuff doing here. That doesn't mean other people weren't supposed to do it. Take this for your own life and be confident in the voice of the Lord for your own life even if it doesn't seem to make sense. And you approach it humbly. You say, well, this is the best I know how. I'm trying to hear the Lord. 1 Corinthians 13, 9, we prophesy in part. And we, uh, 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 what's that? And know in part. I was trying to remember the part. For we know in part and we prophesy in part. And so just be confident. And so that stillness, it opens up opportunities that you would never notice with the noise. The other thing the stillness did for me, I don't know if it did it for you, it created a hunger more than ever for Jesus. There were days on end I was consumed in my spirit in a good way. Jesus, I don't, and I was honest, I said, I don't care if I ever preach again, I don't care if I ever minister again, we can close down relationship church. It, it's fine. Uh, it doesn't, you know, maybe somebody else wants to do it. I want to know you as a friend. I was consumed with that. I just want to know you, Jesus, as a friend. What does that mean? You know, I want to talk to you. I don't want to wait till I get to heaven to have conversations with you. Now, I have lots of conversations with Holy Spirit. I've seen Holy Spirit a couple of different times. I've seen the Father several different times and I have conversations with Him. And I've had conversations some with Jesus. I have never seen Jesus like a lot of people have. People have seen Him come into here. I've never seen Him. Now, I've heard His voice a bunch, but I wanted to see Him as a friend. I was like, I, I can see friends. So this is where I'm at. But it created a hunger in me to know Him more that came out of the stillness Instead of just going to him because I had a, a sermon to preach or something was going on at work or something like that. Did anybody else, their hunger for the Lord increase through this thing? Well, that's quite a bit. And so that, that I was surprised at that. That stillness just came out in different ways. And so, um, let me close with this in the next five minutes here. Another thing I noticed stillness is, is it brings transformation. It brings changes. There's this common verse, and we've talked a lot about it in the past, and, and it was in a lot of different national and local messages. Hebrews 4, 9. There remains then a Sabbath rest for the people of God. For anyone who enters God's rest or stillness also rests from their works. Just as God did from His. That doesn't mean we don't work, but there is a time of stillness. And I heard that verse a lot. You probably heard it a lot. God gave it to you a lot. But I often didn't read the next verse, which is well, verse 11. Well, I'm sorry, I'm ahead of myself. Let us therefore make every effort to enter that rest so that no one will perish by following their example of disobedience. We often don't read verse 12. So make every effort to rest. But we often don't connect it to verse 12. And I went back and looked at it. It is one continuous thought. For the Word of God, which is alive and active, we get the Word in rest. And it's alive and active. Sharper than any double-edged sword, it penetrates even to dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Stillness 
and I know this is why I don't like to be still many times. It, you hear the word of God, which we get excited about, but it comes in to judge what is of the spirit and what is the soul. Like never before. In some ways, maybe not with this group, but in some ways, I think some people, the rest that was forced upon them was to do something they would have never done before because they didn't want to slow down long enough to have their spirit, soul, motivations, thoughts, intentions judged. The Bible says to judge yourself, though. Well, I'll be judged in heaven. You will, but I think you can be judged. Judge yourself now. And so what happens is many people don't want to do that because of the initial pain. But some of this rest and the stillness that he's trying to do is for us to deal with our pain because it hinders us, him getting us to where he wants us to be. And some of the things we're doing are right. Probably most of them are. But he's wanting the motivation right. Think about Joseph. Here's a, a great example. Joseph in the Bible. That was his, his family sold him into slavery. It was prophesied over that, that he would have a great influence around the world and people would bow down. Well, if you've read his story, he was sold into slavery. He went to prison twice. Eventually, he did have all of that. Uh, he came up with the plan that saved the world from fam- starvation. And eventually, his family did come back and bow down before him like it had been prophesied. Now, he was immature. He shouldn't have said that to his older brothers. You're going to bow down towards me. But I guess he didn't have anybody to guide him and help him. Keep this part to yourself. You know, there's some things you just need to keep to yourself. But you know, one of the major reasons he was in prison, there were many reasons, but one of the major reasons, he needed to deal with the trauma caused by his family before he could be a blessing later in the right way to his family. And one of the things about stillness is dealing with traumas and hurts so that we can be a blessing to humanity down the road. Usually where there's trauma, it's the devil seeing the anointing on your life and trying to short-circuit it so that you never walk in it. And one of the biggest things I've found with encouraging people to be still is they don't want to be stilled because they don't want to have to deal with the emotional pain. But God wants us, He's a gentle guy. If we'll just start down that route, He'll go as gently as He can. He'll bring in resources as gently as He can. Because He wants to clean us up to make us effective for the future. I'm going to go a few minutes over here. Elijah. I'm just going to summarize. 1 Kings 19, verses 1 through 9. Elijah did great works for God. There he was on Mount Carmel. Uh, uh, Jezebel was the queen. And she was also the leader of a, a demonic cult and had 450 demonic priests of Ashtaroth all around her. I mean, they were sacrificing babies, temple prostitutes. I mean, it was just, this wasn't mild stuff, okay? Well, he gets those four, those 450 associate pastors demonic priest up on Mount Carmel, by himself, well, not by himself, but one man under the power of God kills them all. I mean, that's pretty cool. But then as you might remember the story, Jezebel in verse 2, 1 Corinthians 9, she heard about this. This She can't be happy. Sent a messenger to Elijah to say, May the gods deal with me, be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow I do not make your life like that, like one of them. Otherwise, I'm going to kill you. In verse 3, after seeing God move, one woman who he easily could have killed, Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. 
And in verse 4, it says, I have had enough of this, Lord. Take my life. I am no better than my ancestors. There was something in him wasn't healed that caused him to run. All the way down in verse 9, I'm summarizing. He ends up in a cave where he spends the night. Now, we weren't in a cave the last six weeks, but there were times where we were by ourselves. You feel like it. He had to face, why am I in this blooming cave? He needed to learn, and it had to do with fear. This is different than the fear we had, but he had to do with the fear of this powerful woman. Even though God protected him from 450 people, couldn't protect him from this one. And the word of the Lord, this is the Hebrews 9, you know, he was still before the Lord, and the, the, word, the, the Lord, the Word is active, pierces between spirit and soul. And this is all God basically said. What are you doing here? He gives each of us a word that's unique for our situation that we have to confront. If what we allow in our lives and don't deal with will eventually dominate us. So go knowing the Lord is gentle and live in a life of stillness from here on out. To always hear His voice, to keep short accounts. To be ready at any time because you're still before the Lord and you can always hear His voice. Socrates, definitely wasn't a Christian, talked about the value of an examined life. That's a good word. We don't want to become too introspection, but wake up in the morning and say, Lord, I want to be close to you. You don't even have to ask to be an examined life. Just say, Father, I want to be close to you. And when you get close to him, whatever is not of him becomes obvious and you just deal with it and work through it and move on. Always be caught up on your holiness. Always be caught up on your passion. Always be caught up on your purity. And I think it starts with alone times on a regular basis. Schedule them if you need to. And then when you're around people, you're not moved. They're moved by what's inside of you. Stillness produces a rest that carries an authority. Amen. We could talk about that a lot, but I think that's good. And so just live with short accounts. Live hungry after Him. And knowing that whatever comes up, He can take care of it and deal with it. Don't live in fear of what has happened in the past or what may happen in the future. Just take it to Him.